used to call these context lectures, and that's mainly what I'm going to do is try to give some context uh, to the life of uh, Milton, to the um, 17th century that he lived in, and especially trying to, uh, trying to acquaint you with Milton's uh, prose as opposed to just his poetry, which uh, he wrote a lot of. That is, he wrote a lot of um, uh, prose along with uh, poetry. And actually kind of in, I don't know if it's like in celebration or in mourning of uh, Paradise Regained is uh, no longer uh, part of the regular curriculum as of this year, I think for both houses. Uh, so, I, so now I get to tell you the amazing story of uh, Paradise Regained and, uh, and tie it in with his prose. I think it, uh, it's almost like the secret meaning of it is probably the most political of his poems. All right, so let's just start in with a little bit of uh, history of the 17th century. I see a little error right there. Uh, Elizabeth should be from 1558 to 1603. Uh, so <laughs> this is, uh, uh, so she just uh, lives into the beginning of the 17th century. Uh, she's Elizabeth Tudor. Uh, the Tudors are the ones that uh, brought uh, the, the, with uh, her, her father, Henry VIII, Protestantism uh, to uh, England. And also, um, in the, uh, this time, uh, not only England, but Scotland. The, uh, when Elizabeth dies, she doesn't have uh, a legitimate heir, being the virgin queen. And uh, so uh, they go to the royal house of uh, Stuart in, in Scotland, uh, the sons of uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, uh, whose death Elizabeth was responsible for. Uh, and uh, they are brought to the thrones as not only the, uh, the kings of, of England, but also of Scotland. So here's just a brief uh, look over the uh, rulers of the 17th century. Uh, here's the, so with the Stuart dynasty, uh, first James, uh, that's, uh, that's the same as uh, like the King James Bible or Jamestown in Virginia. So that gives you a little bit of idea when this is. And then, uh, and then his brother Charles. And then the big event that we'll be talking about is the English Civil War in which uh, the, uh, ac the king actually is uh, deposed and then beheaded. And uh, for a while, uh, the, the country is ruled by Oliver Cromwell uh, during this, uh, uh, basically the, the decade of the 1650s. But um, when Cromwell dies, things aren't going well. His son, uh, Richard, only reigns for, uh, I think, less than a year. And the parliament brings back the Stuarts, uh, their son, uh, Charles II. And this is called the restoration of the, uh, of the monarchy. And uh, these, um, these uh, two kings uh, f finish out the Stuart line. And then um, in the glorious revolution of 1688, uh, the parliament actually um, gets rid of uh, James II and asks William of Orange uh, from the Netherlands, from the Hanover dynasty, in uh, to marry Mary, uh, uh, his queen, and uh, they, uh, they finish out the century for us. So let me, here's another way of uh, looking at it. Um, so you can see mostly we have the Stuart dynasty there in, in red with a little brief, actually this is sometimes called the interregnum between the reigns uh, for, for Cromwell, and then uh, William and Mary. So to to tell you a little bit of the story of this, uh, James and Charles um, are, uh, they have, coming from Scotland, uh, where they didn't have a very strong parliament, they're used to being basically absolute monarchs. They actually uh, promote the doctrine of the divine right of kings. And uh, the British parliament is not that happy about that because they're willing, they're, uh, they're used to having um, a lot more power and so they are. They start butting heads uh, with Charles in particular. 
when he wants to get involved in European wars, uh, he needs some money. And the one right that the parliament has is the power of the purse. And they say, uh, you'll do what we say or we won't fund your wars. And so uh, think, uh, things deteriorate and eventually end up in a war. Uh, the Cromwell uh, establishes himself as uh, the uh, he, he's the leader of the uh, new model army, the Puritan army that helps to uh, uh, to bring to defeat Charles and then depose Charles and then finally to execute Charles. And uh, let's see. Uh, so without telling you again, here again, they bring Charles back. Uh, they bring Charles II back from France where he's been in exile. Uh, he, these, uh, all, one of the issues through this whole time period is these uh, Stuart monarchs are a little too Catholic uh, for, the, um, for the English people and especially for uh, the Presbyterians and uh, Puritans in Parliament. And uh, when it appears that James is his only legitimate heir is going to be a Catholic son, the Parliament has had enough of it, and they bring in Protestant William and Mary. And this is called the Glorious Revolution uh, because a couple of things. First of all, uh, it's a bloodless revolution, so that's a nice kind to have. Uh, they, uh, they're able to bring uh, William in and get rid of James without, uh, without uh, bloodshed. But this is the, the big event of, of uh, 1688 is that the parliament now is calling the shots. And so this is a fully constitutional monarchy in which uh, the king is under the power of the, of the parliament and the constitution. And uh, there's the, uh, the English Bill of Rights uh, gives uh, the people uh, rights that the king cannot uh, transgress. And that, uh, that Bill of Rights becomes the model for the uh, American uh, Bill of Rights. The Revolution becomes a model for the American Revolution and the French Revolution. If you read uh, Burke, uh, Burke will say, but you're not doing a very good job, uh, French people, of uh, imitating our glorious revolution. But uh, uh, now let's look at some of the authors that are from the same period. So uh, Shakespeare actually lives into this uh, century. In fact, uh, his plays are sometimes divided this way so that uh, the ones in the previous century are the Elizabethan plays and the one in this century are the Jacobean plays, James and Jacob being uh, the same name. So ones like oh, uh, Macbeth or The Tempest, those would be uh, in the 17th century in the Jacobean period. Uh, here's our uh, poets, uh, George Herbert and John Donne. Uh, actually, even though uh, George Herbert lives a little longer, he's the younger one. Uh, by about 10 years, but very influenced by John Donne. And in this conflict, uh, they uh, side with the Stuarts. Uh, they are uh, high church uh, Anglicans and, uh, and have royalist sympathies. Uh, so does, interestingly, Thomas Hobbes. Um, and he is actually the tutor to uh, young Charles in exile in France. And um, he, like the Stuarts, um, is a proponent of absolute monarchy. But instead of, uh, unlike the Stuarts, where the Stuarts have the idea of a secular, a, a divine right absolute monarchy, uh, Thomas Hobbes is, uh, he has a kind of uh, breakthrough um, novel, secular uh, absolute monarchy that you can read about in the Leviathan. Now you can see that Thomas Hobbes and John Milton basically uh, they're, they're uh, about the same age. Milton, so uh, 1608 to, 1616, to 1674. Uh, so he lives through uh, both the Civil War, the Restoration, and I'll tell you more about that when we get to his life. The last one I wanted to put on here is John Locke. And, um, and he's another political thinker, and he's most associated as a defender of the parliamentary uh, government uh, that that comes that brings in William and Mary, and so that gives you a background for 
uh, his, his political work. All right, let's go over to talk about the life of Milton. And uh, you can see, I, don't, I'm, I just read off of here. My father had me daily instructed in the grammar school and by other matters at home. He then, after I had acquired a proficiency in various languages and had made a considerable progress in philosophy, sent me to the University of Cambridge. This is Milton's own autobiography, and it's in a work called uh, The Defense of the People of England. And so when uh, someone attacked his character, he said, fine, I'll tell you all about my character. And so we can read all about Milton uh, in, his own, in his own words here. Well, here is a uh, young boy, Milton, uh, born uh, 1608. And here he is going off to college. Let's see, 25 minus 8, that makes him uh, about 17 when he went to Cambridge and about 21 when he uh, graduated. And uh, here he is at that uh, period. He was called uh, at Cambridge the Lady of Christ College because of his uh, dainty looks and uh, his uh, fastidious habits. And um, there he is. You, he actually, there's a, uh, another uh, a book that he, where he writes about how scandalized he is by the uh, immorality of some of the clergy that were attending uh, Cambridge with him at the same time. Uh, after Cambridge, he goes on a little uh, world tour of uh, France and Italy, and here is an artist's rendering of him meeting Galileo, which he did, and he bragged about it in Paradise Lost if uh, a couple of times he throws in Galileo references just to let you know, by the way, I know Galileo. I've met the man myself. Galileo, uh, pretty old by this time, but there he is meeting Milton. Oh. I was going to give you a picture of Archbishop Laud, but uh, as you see, he was executed, and so he couldn't uh, be here to uh, appear in my <laughs> slideshow. Um, the Bishops' War of 1639 uh, through uh, 40, uh, this is the English Civil War heating up and on the religious side before it really gets going on the political side. And uh, Archbishop Laud that you see here uh, is uh, the, is appointed by uh, Charles, and he has a very high church uh, uh, prayer book written, and he is trying to impose uh, a, a high church Anglicanism uh, on, the, on the country of England and, and, uh, and Scotland, and the Scottish in particular are not going to take it. And uh, so they say, not only do we not like your prayer book, uh, not only do we like your fancy, not like your fancy robes, um, we also um, don't like bishops. Uh, we've been over to uh, Geneva where uh, we saw how Calvin uh, did things. And over there, they know, they read the, Old Test the New Testament in Greek. And if you do that, you can see that episkopos bishop and presbyteros elder mean the same thing. And so there's no real difference between, a, um, between an elder and a bishop. And so uh, that becomes the uh, issue, the main issue, that is the, uh, the, the definition, uh, the structure of church government that they, uh, that they fight over. And uh, in the, it, uh, it goes badly, as you see, uh, for, the, uh, for the bishops. Um, uh, particularly Bishop Laud. This calls out uh, Milton's first big uh, uh, spate of, uh, tr of tracks. This is the, the century after the introduction of the printing press and uh, people, there are tract wars going on all the time. Anybody that's got a good idea uh, prints out a bunch of tracks and they start uh, uh, they start having a, uh, a war of, uh, uh, of uh, print war. And so his first big one of Reformation, uh, 1641. I, just, I thought maybe I'll give you a little sample of, uh, of Reformation. Let's see. It, 
just to give you an idea how Milton sounds in prose, I've got a couple of other uh, examples of well as well, but here is the, f let me give you, oh no, it's over here. The first sentence of, um, of, of Reformation. Uh, here he is. Of Reformation in England. Sir, comma, <laughs> amidst those deep and retired thoughts, which with every man, Christianly instructed, ought to be most frequent, of God and of his miraculous ways and works amongst men, of which our religion and worship be performed to him, after the story of our Savior Christ, suffering to the lowest bent of weakness in the flesh and presently triumphing to the highest pitch of glory in the spirit, which drew up his body also till we both be united to him in the revelation of his kingdom, I do not know anything more worthy to take up the whole passion of pity on the one side and joy on the other than to consider first the foul and sudden corruption and then after many a tedious age the long deferred but much more wonderful and happy reformation of the church in these latter days. Period. <laughs> um, there you go. That's Milton's first big sentence in prose. Um, the prelatical, a prelate is another name for a bishop. And so these anti-prelatical tracts are anti-bishop tracts. Oh, I don't think, uh, all of a sudden I thought I might give you, I thought of a passage from Of Reformation that, that just is begging to be, to be read, where he starts talking about, you know, bishops, uh, they, they like that hierarchical uh, kind of government. Uh, Presbyterians, uh, they like the, uh, you know, the equality among uh, themselves. And so the bishops, you can con compare their kind of, uh, th their kind of church government to a pyramid and the, bish and the uh, Presbyterians to a cube. And which is better? Well, obviously a cube um, because the uh, pyramid is the most dividing and schismatical form that the geometricians know. Uh, those little things are sharp and pointy and they hurt people. And do you want a church government like that? I ask you. Uh, and by the way, have you noticed those hats that the prelates are wearing these days with their forked miters? It's the very badge of schism. Uh, the stamp of the cloven hoof uh, whom they serve, etc. Oh, they can hardly fail to gore one another with the sharp spires uh, for uh, upper place and precedence and so on. Uh, not so with the cube-like Presbyterians. Uh, so, you, did you buy that argument? Uh, I was asking if you hide all or something. <laughs> yeah, well, no, this was, you, this was the way that uh, uh, tracks of the time went. And not only that, uh, I should have brought in some scurrilous uh, defamation that they would go on for pages and pages about like, and I heard this guy wasn't even very good looking either. <laughs> and if he's not good looking, how, uh, 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 they, uh, one of the ones that attacked Milton went on and on about, I heard he was blind and you know what that means. And so then uh, Milton comes back and says, I'll tell you what it means. It means I'm Tiresias. It means I'm Homer. It means I'm the prophet Samuel. And, and he goes on like that for a page or so. Um, here is of Reformation that I just read you the first uh, paragraph of. And here is probably the best known of these anti-prelatical tracts, The Reason of Church Government. And here we're kind of warming to the theme of Milton's uh, political and uh, episcopal, uh, uh, sorry, not episcopal, his, uh, his, his political and his ecclesiastical uh, thoughts. And so here is what he has uh, against uh, prelaty, the, the, uh, the uh, church that are run by bishops. Because prelaty, he says, slights the deliberate and chosen counsel of Christ, whose glory is in the weakness of fleshly things, and both in her fleshly supportments, her carnal doctrine of ceremony and tradition, and in her violent and secular power, goes quite counter to the prime end of Christ's coming in the flesh. The absolute voice uh, because of all this, the absolute voice of truth and all her children pronounce this prelaty to be more anti-Christian than the anti-Christ himself. Now, 
That sound, I mean, that's, uh, that's strong language, but it is like, since the Reformation, uh, everyone's been calling each other the Antichrist. Uh, but it's worth saying here, like Antichrist, later on when we get to, uh, Satan sh shows up in, uh, in Paradise Regained. Uh, he appears somewhat in the figure of the Antichrist. That is, he is representing a, uh, a church that is uh, setting itself against the deliberate and chosen counsel of Christ. Christ uh, rep uh, was uh, happy to uh, promote his ministry in weakness. They need all kind of fleshly supportment, ceremonies, tradition, and especially violent and secular power. They need to get the government involved uh, to uh, impose their will on people. Not so with Christ. Here's a great uh, Milton uh, image from the same book. So long as the church, in the true imitation of Christ, can be content to ride upon an ass, carrying herself and her government along in a mean and simple guise, she may be as he is, a lion of the tribe of Judah. And in her humility, all men with loud hosannas will confess her greatness. But when despising the mighty operation of the spirit by the weak things of this world, she thinks to make herself bigger and more considerable by using the way of civil force and jurisdiction. As she sits upon this lion, she changes into an ass. And instead of hosannas, every man pelts her with stones and dirt. So the first picture is Christ uh, riding the donkey into Jerusalem. And he is the true uh, lion of the tribe of Judah. And the church could be that today if she would be content to uh, do things the Christ-like way of weakness. When she takes on uh, the power of the state uh, riding on the lion, then we have the incongruous picture of a donkey uh, riding a lion. And that would be prelaty. All right, here's the next big event in Milton's life, marriage to Mary Powell. Um, let's see, he's about uh, 34 or five, something like that. She is 16. And uh, things uh, get off on a uh, bad foot when uh, a little bit after, like within the first few months, uh, she goes on a little trip to see her parents at Oxford and does not come back. Uh, and Milton uh, oh. demands that she comes back. She doesn't come back. At the, the, the uh, Civil War is already heating up here, and Oxford is on the side of the Royalists. Uh, Milton, being a Cambridge man, he's uh, on the other side, and so there's some tension that way. But in good uh, Milton style, uh, what he does about it is he writes uh, four, like, 100-page long uh, books about the freedom to divorce. Uh, the Doctrine and Discipline of Divorce, The Judgment of Martin Bucer Concerning Divorce, and these two, Tetrachord and Cholesterian, are also about divorce. And uh, he's arguing basically for what we'd call no-fault divorce, and uh, that is if people are uh, come together and uh, they uh, have some kind of uh, difference of temperament where they can't stay together, they shouldn't be uh, forced to stay together. Well, uh, interesting. Now, it's hard to say, and it, it, it's easy just to say, see, uh, Milton, uh, his home life just spills right over into his, it, and we don't have all the evidence, but it, it, it's, it's kind of tempting to say that. Uh, as a result of this, though, he writes probably what is his most famous uh, prose piece, uh, Areopagetica, uh, and this is, a defense of free speech. So when people said, hey, you can't write that kind of stuff about divorce, he said, this is a free country, isn't it? And he gives a, uh, a stirring defense of the freedom of the press and of, the spe and of speech, uh, basically arguing uh, that uh, all of these things should be able to be published so that people can uh, compare them and that error can be defeated and that the truth can win out. Um, and so if you want to read some great Milton prose, probably the place to start is with Areopagitica. And it's not just great prose, it really is like foundational to our understanding of uh, uh, the freedom of press, the freedom of speech. He also writes a, 
an interesting little book on education uh, where he in some ways recommends what you might call a Tory education. He's a classical uh, humanist uh, reading the uh, great Western classics. And this comes in in an interesting way when you get around to Paradise Regained. Uh, it, uh, he also gives uh, advice for like how much exercise you should get and uh, what, what, how much farming you should do. And oh, inter uh, interesting, you can, it's a fun little thing to s compare your uh, education to uh, what, what Milton uh, recommends. There is the doctrine and discipline of divorce restored to the good of both sexes from the bondage of canon law and other mistakes to the true meaning of scripture in the law and gospel compared, etc. And Milton is quite a scholar in both Greek and Hebrew and he gives you uh, page after page of his own uh, interesting hermeneutics and much of it is a breakthrough into better hermeneutics from previous times. All right, time to get over to the English Civil War. I've already referred to it uh, briefly. Uh, the two sides in the English Civil War, on the one side are the Royalists that are loyal to King Charles, on the other side the Parliamentarians uh, who come to be led by Oliver Cromwell and uh, the, the um, the kind of uh, casual names for these. On the one side, the Cavaliers and the Roundheads. Actually, the Roundheads actually comes from the haircut style. Uh, the, the Puritans uh, often uh, cut their heads, uh, their hair short, and people made fun of them and called them Roundheads because of that. Uh, and they would mock uh, the Cavaliers uh, who had uh, who liked to wear their hair in long curls and so on. And so that became, but th that wasn't cut and dried. In fact, Milton himself was quite, uh, as you saw, uh, had some beautiful hair that he was quite proud of and liked to wear it long and, and, and lovely. Uh, so uh, the, the, the basic th uh, argument was over uh, the power of the king versus the power of the uh, people, the constitution, the parliament. Uh, and so, whereas the uh, Charles the Stuart King, uh, you know, had a high view that he was the divinely appointed uh, King of England, uh, the parliamentarian said, actually, uh, uh, you uh, work with or maybe for us and you work under the agreements that we've made. Um, there's also, though, this religious element uh, in that the, the royalists are uh, high church, uh, Episcopal, that is, they have the bishop hierarchy form of church government, and the Presbyterians and the Puritans uh, have a, either an elder-led uh, uh, form of church government, uh, that's what the Presbyterians especially stood for, and the Puritans, uh, who are seeking to kind of purify the church further, uh, further the Reformation in the um, English church. Um, Milton, oh, there they are. There's Oliver Cromwell, and here is uh, King Charles with his beautiful hair uh, and mustache. This is, um, this is uh, Milton's uh, first big work on this. Oh, no it's not. Uh, the first one is Tenure of Kings and Magistrates. Mm, this is his second big work on this. Uh, this one is his work called, in, as you can see there, it has a Greek title, Iconoclastes. Oh, I forgot to tell you what Areopagitica meant. Uh, that, uh, that one has to do with the Areopagus. Uh, I mean, its title has to do with the Areopagus, which is Mars Hill in Athens. And because uh, Milton addresses his campaign for free speech to the parliament, he says, you like the noble philosophers on Mars Hills, I address, O parliament. And uh, that's why it has that name. This one, Iconoclastes, uh, it really, uh, it has, it means, uh, it's, about, it's an icon breaker. And, uh, and it's an answer to a book called the Icon Basilicae. 
the icon basilicae, oh, was the portraiture of his sacred majesty in his solitudes and sufferings. Uh, it was probably, uh, when, the king was, uh, when the king was killed, uh, they published a book that was supposed to have been written by him, but Milton says, I don't think much of it was actually written by him anyway. Uh, they just put it together, and it's all about his, his terrible sufferings and his sadness and his solitude to, to, uh, drum, up, uh, to drum up sympathy uh, for the king. And, oh, and it had this picture of the king, uh, you know, with his crown of thorns and... Uh, basically making him making the king into uh, a a second Christ uh, who died for the sins of the evil English people and so on and Milton just wasn't going to have it and he was going to remind everybody of all the ways that this king had been acting like a tyrant in the um, in the month before uh, the king was actually beheaded uh, M Milton wrote a piece called The Tenure of Kings and Magistrates, which argues for why it's okay to behead the king. And his basic idea is he's not a king. He's a tyrant. And besides that, he was actually writing to the Presbyterians to go ahead and finish the job. You guys already have, if you've kept him in a prison for three years, it's not like he's your king anymore. He's a, a, he's a prisoner. And so uh, that's how he argues. Maybe I'll give you... Uh, just a little bit of uh, the way that he argues there, as as this gives you another little picture into um, into Milton's political thought. Um, he says, first of all, see if you can pick up the biblical reference here. He says, uh, this is our hope, that as God was heretofore angry with the Jews who rejected him and his form of government to choose a king. Did you catch that? He's talking about uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8 where the Israelites say, we want a king, uh, we want Saul. Uh, just as God was angry with them who uh, rejected him, God, and his form of government to choose a king, we hope that God will bless us and be propitious to us who reject a king and make him only our leader and supreme government in conformity as near may be of his own ancient government. So uh, surely God will bless us uh, for doing the opposite of what Israel did in choosing God as our king, uh, not uh, this uh, tyrant. Um, he refers, uh, uh, he also, here's another scriptural argu argument. Deuteronomy 7.14 says, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations about me, these words, says Milton, confirm us that the right of choosing, yea, of the changing of their government, is by the grant of God himself in the people. God told the people, if you want a king, you can do it, and so the people have that right. Um, you will, if you haven't read Hobbes yet, or you're just reading Hobbes, you'll see uh, Hobbes using the same passages uh, to come up with this. Basically, what is a uh, contract uh, form of, of government? You can see that, uh, let's see, oh, I think I forgot, that, uh, in, as a result of these uh, defenses, uh, actually, he was hired by Cromwell to be the Secretary of Foreign Tongues because basically uh, he could write. Uh, he could write in. Uh, I'm trying to remember all the languages he knows. Certainly, uh, Greek, Hebrew, Italian, French. Um, I'm not sure beyond that. But anyway, uh, so when people, they'd get letters from France, they'd take it over to Milton, he would translate it for them and then write uh, back to them. But uh, these uh, two, the defense of the English people for killing their kings, uh, basically, he wrote in, uh, a, in very proficient Latin. And so uh, both of these are defenses of the English people uh, in his role as Secretary of France foreign tongues under Cromwell defending the English people. All right. 
uh, it was during this time that Milton uh, became blind. Uh, he was totally blind by about the time Cromwell came to power. And so he, from this point on, everything that he writes is by dictation, uh, like Paradise Lost, for example. Uh, he dictated it to friends who would come over to the house, including the poet John Dryden, and particularly uh, Milton's daughters uh, uh, wrote a lot of Paradise Lost. Here's a little, a famous, the beginning of a famous sonnet about his blindness. When I consider how my light is spent, ere half my days in this dark world and wide, and that one talent which is death to hide, lodged with me useless, he goes on. Um, and so writing about, uh, oops, his blindness. Let's see if I can, yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, because he's uh, working for uh, Cromwell and had been, you know, uh, a writer of the uh, to defend the death of uh, of Charles the First. Uh, when Charles the Second comes back, uh, Milton is in trouble. But bravely, I mean, you might say, on the eve of the Restoration, he is writing uh, books both about church government and then actually about. Um, about how to establish a free commonwealth in Great Britain. Uh, then he goes into hiding. Then he's caught. Then he's thrown into prison. Uh, but he isn't there long because people like John Dryden, who's uh, a royalist but who loves uh, great poetry uh, and thinks that Milton is a great English hero, uh, argue for him to be uh, let out. So he was only in prison for a brief time, maybe a month. It's in this, the time of the Restoration that he finally turns uh, to writing the poetry that he'd been preparing himself to write his whole life. Um, he, he said, he gives the picture of himself uh, early on saying, uh, I've been striving to uh, write these poems my whole life, but duty to my country uh, made me put them off and write all of this prose for the freedom of my people. But when I'm writing prose, it's as if I'm writing with my left hand. And so people often call the prose of Milton the works of the left hand. Uh, and so now he finally gets to write with his right hand. And uh, actually, it's his daughters at the, by that point uh, and friends that uh, write these. In 1667, he publishes Paradise Lost in 10 books. It still, ha it still gets to the end of the story. It's just it has different divisions. He later says, hey, you know, it would kind of be more epic-y, uh, like the Aeneid and all, if I could make it into 12 books. And so he splits two books up and adds some extra introductions and gives the book the version that we read. But in 1671, he writes, Paradise uh, Regained and Samson Agonistes. And by the way, all of these are in your uh, little complete, you know, uh, poetry of Milton, and you can read these. Uh, and I just urge you uh, to, you know, when you have uh, b both of these, uh, Paradise and Re Regain and Samson Agonistes, uh, you could read them maybe in, oh, I don't know, an hour and a half, something like that. They're not like uh, Paradise Lost or, uh, you know, Russian novels or something like that. <laughs> uh, Samson Agonistes is the story of Samson told as a Greek drama. And uh, if you like Greek drama and, you know, uh, you like the Bible, uh, <laughs> it, uh, this, this could be just the thing for you. And I, I, I've sometimes toyed with, like, could we get this into the Torah curriculum for that reason? And because it's almost like the most perfectly realized work of Milton's in a little kind of gym-like quality. Uh, but we'll talk about Paradise uh, Regained for the rest of our time. Here is his death mask. That was a popular thing to do back then. After somebody died, you do a plaster their face and uh, uh, make a mold. And there he is in 1674, the year that Paradise Lost in 12 books was published. Uh, I'm just going to uh, briefly show you some pictures of Paradise Lost. Oh! secret document. <laughs> Forgot this was in here. <laughs> All right, now you know Milton's secret. 
Uh, but uh, uh, written in Latin, so you know, if you're reading Latin, you're picking up on all this. You see that it says De Doctrina Christiana up there of Christian doctrine. This is actually Milton's secret theology, which was not even discovered till after a hun over a hundred years after his death. And uh, you have bits of it in your book, and you can go and read on Christian doctrine. And it's, it's a little scandalous. It was, he was a kind of a free thinker. And um, uh, you know, like he was his, for example, particularly like his Trinitarian uh, theology, uh, it will, does not uh, line up with Orthodox uh, Trinitarian theology. Uh, Milton is a monist. He believes that there's no uh, difference between matter and spirit, except for spirits more refined matter. He has uh, several interesting uh, ideas that he just put in his secret theological journal. So, just kind of cool that that's out there. But anyway, here's some pictures from Paradise Lost uh, by Gustave Doré Woodcuts. Ooh, that's not Gustave Doré. That's um, George Lucas, I think, did that version. That's the no, I'm not. Sure. <laughs> it looks like the. Uh, uh, yeah, here's an old one. This is uh, this is Satan uh, coming up on sin with her nasty, snaky self and death, her uh, incestuous son. You actually read Paradise uh, Lost yourself, so you know there's no surprises here. Here is Paradise Regained, which was published together with Samson Agonistes, and we'll talk about it uh, for the remainder of the time. The first surprise about Paradise Regained after you've read Paradise Lost is you think like, where as a Christian does Paradise get regained? Well, Easter comes to mind, or uh, Good Friday maybe even more. Uh, that is um, the death and resurrection of Christ. Uh, and yet Milton writes the whole Paradise Regained about the desert temptation of Jesus by Satan. Uh, that's it. And it makes a certain bit of sense because uh, what Adam and Eve lost through temptation by the devil, uh, Jesus regained by withstanding temptation. And this kind of pairing had been uh, traditional for, uh, for centuries, uh, for, uh, I, don't, I guess it can't be millennia, but over a thousand years. Um, however, um, Milton uh, does uh, some big changes on uh, the way that uh, Jesus' temptation uh, by Satan is understood. Probably the best way to see this is to, we, is to compare his uh, temptation of Jesus with uh, medieval uh, presentations of it, particularly in these Corpus Christi plays. On the Feast of Corpus Christi, they had these dramas on stages. I, I was looking for one of Christ and Satan. Uh, I'm not even sure what's happening here, but this is pretty clearly hell, and demons are jumping out of it, and they're coming in. Um, I'm not sure what, what they're going to steal this guy's soul away. And they're, you know, it's out, and it's a festival day. And uh, but in any case, uh, one of the and the, they they had a whole series of them. I don't know, 20 or 30 of them that told the whole story of the world from the beginning to the end, and each guild took their own one. Uh, like, um, oh, I'm trying to remember, like the drapers did the creation so they could make pretty drapes with stars on them for the, and so on. And in these plays, uh, they, the temptation of Christ uh, is always portrayed by the means of what's called the triple equation. And this is a way of putting, understanding Christ's temptation by putting it together uh, with the temptation of Adam and Eve. So, uh, they do it by means of 1 John 2.16, which tells about the desires of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And it says those are the three temptations, uh, which we understood in a kind of medieval or I don't know, maybe patristic way as three vices. 
the, the kind of master vices of gluttony, pride, and avarice. And you might remember Augustine goes on for about 10 pages confessing his sins according to this scheme. Let's first think about gluttony and everything that might go under the lust of the flesh. He goes on and Augustine had some stuff to confess that had to do with the lust of the flesh. But let's move on to, let's talk about uh, the lust of the eyes, the greed, and then the pride of life. Well, when the, the way this goes is when Jesus turned stones into, when he was tempted to turn stones into bread, it was like the sin that our uh, first parents uh, actually uh, gave into, the temptation they gave into, this, uh, the, the temptation to gluttony. They saw, says the biblical text, that it was the fruit was good for food and a delight to the eyes, and they said, I want some of that. And so uh, what, when they, they were gluttons, uh, Jesus was not a glutton. He refused to be given to gluttony. Uh, when he was uh, tempted to jump from the temple, that was a temptation to pride, and that goes together with uh, Satan's offer to Adam and Eve, you shall be as God. Uh, and then uh, finally the third climactic one, when um, he's uh, asked to bow to receive the kingdom, that goes with the lust of the eyes or greed. And uh, Gregory the Great, who's, they, sometimes they even mention him in the play, like they'll say, and by the way, uh, as Gregory says, uh, greed isn't just uh, for money, it could be uh, for knowledge too. So that's how you should understand it. And the way that this works is basically uh, each one of us could think back through almost any day and think, there's probably been some times when I gave in to the lust of the flesh today. Uh, or at least was tempted for food or, uh, you know, uh, lust, uh, that kind of thing. Pride, greed, these are something that everybody deals with all the time. Milton, in concert with the reformers, said, that's not what these were about at all. These were not the temptations of every man every day. These were special messianic uh, temptations. Um, and so, first thing he does, uh, well, the first thing he does, he puts the temple one last. He goes with the Luke order and the bread one first. And the truth is, none of these are really uh, temptations in the sense of lures to do something that you just really want to do or down on the inside. Um, but he makes something different out of each one of them. And uh, I'll talk about each one in turn. but. Besides uh, taking them out of the temptation, uh, making them, uh, they're not for everyone. He, what he mainly does is he does this kingly one and he says, this is mainly the temptation of a king. Jesus is a king and uh, Satan knows it. And so Satan is going to tempt him like you would tempt a king. And so uh, the big thing that Milton does is he makes most of the temptations, the kingdom temptations, he introduces uh, a whole bunch of temptations uh, to a lot of different uh, kingdoms, uh, a lot of different things inside the kingdom temptation. Um, so, uh, so let me, I, I, I'll spend the rest of my time showing uh, what this different ordering does to make uh, paradise uh, regained into an, a text about the separation of uh, church and state. So let me go back first and look at the uh, stones to bread uh, temptation. And I think I'm, let's see. When uh, Satan's first time out, he comes uh, to Jesus um, as an old man and uh, he's a, an aged man in rural weeds following as seem the quest of some stray you. Uh, he comes as an old shepherd. If you read, if you've read uh, Fairy Queen and think of Archimago, uh, probably Milton is thinking uh, in the same way, but what he's thinking here is uh, here comes Satan dressed as a kindly old shepherd and he says, 
Oh, Jesus, let me give you a little bit of advice. Uh, we out here in the desert haven't had much food lately, and I know that uh, maybe you'd like to uh, you know, help us out here. So my advice would be that you give us some food and you could feed yourself at the same time. Uh, Jesus basically uh, sees through it by uh, recognizing, I know who you are and you know who I am. Uh, why dost thou then suggest to me distrust, knowing who I am as I know who thou art? He says, I don't need your advice, Satan. Uh, you're a false pastor, uh, not a true pastor, a false shepherd, not a true shepherd. And, um, and uh, I don't need to trust you because I already trust God. Well, Satan right away says, you're right, you got me, I'm Satan. Uh, but, you know, it's not like I'm all bad. I was just working for God in that whole Job story. And I've been uh, trying to help people out ever since then. Like, for example, I like to give people oracles, like at Delphi and so on. <laughs> and uh, Jesus says, you know what? Uh, people don't need uh, oracles at Delphi uh, because now they have uh, the living uh, word of God. Um, he says, um, henceforth oracles are ceased, and thou no more with pomp and sacrifice shall be inquired at Delphos or anywhere, at least in vain, for they shall find thee mute. God hath now sent his living oracle into the world to teach his final will and sends his spirit of truth henceforth to dwell in pious hearts an inward oracle. Hmm. Now we have the Word of God. Now we have the Holy Spirit. We don't need Delphi. Well, uh, that could be just historically true, though Milton wrote a, a poem called The Nativity Ode where he clearly said uh, the oracle stopped the day Jesus was born. Interesting. So why is Satan still talking about I love to give oracles? Probably because he represents the Catholic Church. Uh, that is, uh, the, the, Satan here is playing the role of a Catholic, uh, uh, of the Catholic Church saying, uh, as a king, uh, you're going to want uh, some, uh, some advice from, uh, direct from God. Uh, and through uh, uh, papal uh, pronouncements, I can give you the word of God. And Jesus says, I don't need your papal announcements because I've got the Bible and the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. The next uh, set of uh, temptations, uh, banquet, riches, and glory. Uh, as part of a, uh, these kingdom temptations. Um, anybody recognize banquet, riches, and glory? Where is that coming from? It's coming from the triple equation. So he pulled off uh, the significance of the, the ones and he, and he re-put them in here as a uh, uh, gluttony, uh, greed, and uh, pride. Uh, and yet now they are uh, kingly banquets, kingly riches, and kingly glory. The whole time that Satan's offering them to Christ, he's offering them as, you're going to need some money to be king. If you're going to be a king, you're going to be able to need to give out glory. And how would you like some kingly food? And Jesus says, uh, I don't need any kingly food, especially from you. And as you start reading about uh, the food that he's offering, uh, you realize uh, probably uh, what he has in mind is uh, the luxurious uh, ceremonies that he's been criticizing uh, in the high church uh, Anglican one. Uh, and in his, uh, in his uh, prose tracks. And uh, it's, it's not so much uh, simply the, um, it's not simply that he's uh, rejecting uh, luxurious uh, ceremony. Uh, he says, the main thing I'm rejecting is that it comes from you, Satan, which uh, is another way of saying like, where do you think we got these uh, luxurious ceremonies? They came from the Antichrist church that we've uh, had a reformation uh, to get 
uh, away from. Uh, I'm going to jump down to Israel, Parthia, and Rome. This is the actual kind of the part that you think of as especially from, uh, from the biblical story. When he shows him Parthia and Rome, he takes him up on a mountain and gives him a kind of special telescope where he can see over uh, to the east where the uh, Roman enemies Parthia has a massive army and uh, over to uh, the west to Rome where uh, the center of civilization at, at Jesus' time. Uh, and he reminds him, uh, you're supposed to be saving Israel. You're supposed to be saving uh, who, uh, what people in the Reformed or Calvinist uh, thought would say is the church. And he says, and to do that, you're going to need force and you're going to need uh, culture, civilization, luxury, empire. And uh, Jesus says, actually, I don't need either one. It could be, uh, the, the, the simple read of this is simply that Jesus is rejecting uh, kingly power. He's uh, saying, I don't need an army, I don't need a, a, uh, a palace and a throne, I don't need all the things from civilization. Um, one author that I've read offers a more interesting uh, thesis, which is he's actually uh, here saying, I don't need all the things that Rome, that is the Catholic Church has, and also I don't need Protestant power. That is, uh, Cromwell and others have said, what if we uh, made a league with the Dutch, the German, the Swedes, and we became a big Protestant army and then marched on Rome? And Jesus says, that's not my plan either. I'm not sure if I go for that, for that or not, but in any case, once again, the issue is uh, Jesus, who uh, stands for, as the founder of the church, stands for the church, uh, is rejecting um, the political, uh, earthly, temporal power as, uh, as unnecessary. Um, let me read... Uh, for the beginning of his, uh, of, of his last two uh, prose tracts I mentioned, uh, one of them is called The Treatise of Civil Power and Ecclesiastical Causes, begins this way. Two things there be which have been ever found working much mischief to the church of God and the advancement of the truth. One, force on the one side restraining, and two, higher on the other side, corrupting the teachers therein. Uh, there's two things that, are, that, the, that always uh, corrupt the church, and uh, one of them is uh, money, and the other one of them is uh, force. When the church starts uh, uh, depending on money and force, uh, that's when uh, it loses its gospel simplicity and power. The last uh, temptation, actually it's at this point after the, uh, after the temptation to Roman em Empire that uh, Satan actually says, why don't you just bow down to me and I'll give you everything. And um, interestingly, uh, Jesus says, uh, the dominion you get, that you have was donated to you uh, and it's not even uh, yours to begin with. The way that he talks about uh, donation there probably means to suggest uh, a theme that Milton and other uh, Puritans were always harping on that is the so-called donation of Constantine uh, which in which uh, the uh, Constantine is supposed to have signed over uh, uh, temporal power and wealth and land to the church uh, and it was beginning to be expected, uh, understood that that had been a forgery. And they said the whole idea of the church owning lots of property and power, uh, that's where the church went wrong. And Jesus says, I'm not going down that path. Then though, uh, they go, Satan says, I've got one last temptation for you. And that is, uh, don't, wouldn't you like to have the wisdom of, of Greece. In fact, aren't you going to need uh, the wisdom of Greece uh, to be the ruler uh, that you want? 
Here's, here's the way that uh, Satan argues. Uh, he says, all knowledge is not couched in Moses' law, the Pentateuch, or what the prophets wrote. The Gentiles also know and write and teach to admiration, led by nature's light. And with the Gentiles much thou must converse, ruling them by persuasion as thou meanest. Without their learning, how wilt thou with them, or they with thee, hold conversation meet? How wilt thou reason with them, or how refute their idolisms, traditions, and paradoxes? Error by his own arms is best evinced. You're going to need Greek wisdom uh, to persuade the Greeks and then to argue the Greeks out of their heresies. Now, uh, traditional readers of Paradise Regained have said, it seems like in his old age, uh, Milton just got tired of classical learning and said, we don't need any, class, any more uh, classical learning. We'll just, uh, we'll just read the Bible and that'll be enough for us. Um, that seems unlikely. Uh, if you read, like I was mentioning, of education, he lays out a whole like program of classical, uh, 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 classical education. He published with Paradise Regained, Samson Agonistes, you know, Samson Agonistes as Samson as a Greek tragedy. What's more likely going on here is there was a controversy in Milton's day, and it goes on to our day of. Uh, what does a minister need before he can be ordained? Well, uh, says Bishop Laud and the high church people, he needs to go to Oxford, get a classical education in Greek and Latin, learn Aristotle uh, and Aquinas, and be able to, uh, you know, uh, write some Latin poetry. The Puritan said, that's just your way of, number one, getting money for Oxford, and number two, holding the reins on all these uh, pastors. If there's a pastor that knows the gospel and the Bible, he should be able to be ordained. And Milton is adding here. And by the way, you can get a lot of literature, philosophy, and so on uh, straight from your Bible. And so, once again, he is arguing for basically a radical church politics that says, uh, we don't need all of the classical learning uh, to be a pastor. Uh, the Bible uh, can be enough for us. The final temptation, whoops, is he takes him to the temple. And once again, it's hardly a temptation. It's a final a desperate uh, uh, time for, uh, for Satan to try to figure out uh, what kind of king uh, Jesus actually is. And uh, Jesus uh, uh, rebuffs this final one and uh, Satan falls down uh, like the Sphinx it says and then he's taken into his glory. So the whole way through uh, Christ as the representation of uh, the church uh, refuses to give in to, um, to uh, any kind of uh, offers of political power political uh, money, political uh, support that would uh, give them, uh, that they would control through education or through ceremonies. And uh, so in this way, uh, he is arguing for a church that's separated from the state. Let me just uh, kind of wrap up with, by saying uh, how this fits in uh, with, uh, with the Morgan House um, uh, sophomore spring that some of you are in. Uh, and that is, uh, we have this odd uh, semester in which you start off uh, with, uh, say, Richard II, who could you know, stand in here for uh, the Stuart Kings, who's arguing that what makes him a king is God. And so you have this secular, you have this divine right of kings, uh, a divine uh, kingship uh, kind of model. You go through the whole semester, you know, like, as we have it now, you just hit Machiavelli and you say, you know, divine right of kings, whatever. Uh, what makes a king a king is uh, he's got the most power and he knows how to use it and he knows how to, uh, you know, be sly like a fox and use force like a lion. That's what makes you a king. 
uh, and by the end of it, you're, we're going to read the uh, United States Constitution, and there's nothing in there about, uh, you know, actually what's in there about the establishment of religion is that the state shouldn't be involved in it. So we go from sacred to secular, and you think, is that a good thing? Well, one way of thinking of it as a good thing is uh, if you say um, the in this time period, the state is allowed to be the state and figure out things in a secular realm, and the church is allowed to be the church and figure out things uh, in a spiritual realm, and that's uh, a contribution uh, of, uh, of, of Milton. Now, just to end up here, I want to point out one other little interesting Tory text. Uh, in Hawthorne, there's a story called The Gray Champion. An odd little story that you'll wonder why you're reading it, and only you who've been at this lecture will know why I decided that we needed to read this Hawthorne story. Uh, because it's about a Puritan champion, basically a Puritan superhero, that shows up at the glorious revolution of James II over in America. Uh, and uh, it's at the time when they have this. A uh, popish monarch, uh, says uh, uh, Hawthorne, and uh, but then people come to America and they're trying to uh, to bring people back under the rule of uh, of the uh, of this of the Stuarts. Well, then this mysterious superhero shows up. He is a man in old Puritan dress, a dark cloak, and a steeple-crowned hat in the fashion of at least 50 years before, with a heavy sword upon his thigh. By the way, Milton was pretty proud of his swordsmanship. He trained with a, uh, trained with a sword, but a staff in his hand to assist the tremulous gait of age. Who is this masked man? Uh, well, he is the man who appears whenever domestic tyranny uh, should oppress us, or the invader step pollute our soil. You may still uh, see the gray champion, for he is the type of New England's hereditary spirit, and his shadowy march on the eve of danger must ever be the pledge that New England's sons will vindicate their ancestry. Uh, whenever prelacy, persecution, the union of church and state, and all those abominations which had driven the Puritans to the wilderness uh, arise, the, uh, then in the hour of need, the gray champion will stand forth. I think Hawthorne has Milton in the back of his mind and is saying, uh, whenever uh, church and state become too uh, combined, uh, Milton will show up again as the gray champion of the separation of church and state. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.